I am out here for you. You don't know what it's like to be me out here for you. It is an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about, okay? Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. You know, we're into January. The, the 2019 comic sales uh, numbers are all final now. And I've got a good friend of mine, Comics Perch, in here to talk to uh, with me about it and break down some of these sales. How are you doing, Perch? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on this morning. Anxious to look at 2019. A lot of good data there. Overall, single issue comic dollar sales rose almost 4%, while graphic novel sales declined 2% for an overall increase of 2.23% uh, in 2019. Of course, those are dollars sold, not units shipped. Marvel once again dominated the market with a 44.72 to 30.74 lead over DC in unit share and 40.2 to 29.29 lead in dollar share. Image is the number three publisher as normal in terms of market share with about 8% of dollars and 7.7% .7 of units down a bit from the previous year after scaling back their line. You know, what do you make of these numbers, Perch? I think there's a bunch of things that, that you can draw from this. Um, so first off, um, the good news, I think, for the comic industry is that you're not seeing uh, the, the collapse that many were predicting in 2018 and 2019, and then I, people are still predicting it for 2020. So that the comic industry is, is stable-ish. Um, where you get into these numbers and how they, they, they look for the broader comic business is it you almost have to look beyond what was sold in comics and you have to say the market itself, is it healthy? Is the retail market healthy? Is the current distribution into this market healthy? These numbers are stable, but should they be? With everything that's happening in movies and, and attention to comics, how do these, you know, do these numbers track with the amount of attention that's going into the industry? And, and the answer is, so this is a good news, bad news. The good news is the comic industry is not dropping. The bad news is it's not growing enough where other parts of the market are growing. And if you combine that with the idea that retail may be weak in the coming years of how comics are sold, that's not good. We should be seeing a ramp. But the other thing to take away from this is, I mean, a lot of these numbers for Marvel do really hook onto what happened with House of X, Powers of Ten. That was a huge surprise in a sense. If you can track out the X-Men titles, uh, you know, as they were before House of X, you just continue that through the year. You see the true impact that that House of X Powers of Ten did to Marvel's bottom line and their, their both their unit and dollar share dollar share um, numbers. So that that was a big thing for them. Again, there's a good news bad news aspect to that. The good news is they hit upon something; it did well. The bad news is the rest of their line did not have those same kind of bumps. You you did see uh, Absolute Carnage do very well, of course, as an event. You saw War of the Realms underperform as an event, so it's still it's it's too many too many eggs in a too small a basket, which is is an odd way of saying it. Given I just I did a video with you earlier about how with all the Dawn of X titles are doing too much, but um, there is a challenge where Marvel is concerned. DC is 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 stable. DC's um I think kind of taking a, a page from Image, where Image scaled back. It did scale back their numbers, but they have a healthier, stronger business as a result. You look at the per number units of their books image looks stronger with the moves they made. And it feels like DC is, is wanting to, to some extent, follow suit with the way they pulled back. And so these numbers in this gap may be as a result of some changes that they're doing for their business for the future. And I would predict that in 2020, 2021, you're going to see this, this gap narrow. You're going to see DC and image now start to retake more of the business with the strengthening they've done for their line. You know, speaking of, of DC, you know, Black Label has had a really big impact. You know, DC did do some austerity measures where they scale the line back. It's kind of going back up to where it was, but they started focusing on some of these premium books that are they're a bigger format with with bigger name writers like your Scott Snyder's, you know, Greg Capullo, great uh, creative team, you know, the Batman Dan book and like that. And I think they really uh, did did boost their their numbers up with that. And it really helped stabilize their sales. It did. And it's a smart, I think you, you hit upon the right word is focus. So DC sent a message to their consumers and to retailers and everybody else that they're going to focus some efforts on some key books, make sure that those are of a good quality shipped, you know, on, on time ish. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a moving statement there, but, but they were, they basically, they wanted to, to make a statement that these are books worth investing in. These are books that, that we as a publisher are going to invest in. And these are books that you can, you can rely on. And the thing that retailers in the comic industry needs, and it's why images moves are good. It's why I, I you see, you hear a little bit of skepticism in my voice for Marvel, you know, reliability is such a big deal for, for retailers in terms of ordering their product, knowing what to hand over to customers. 
that's that's how you you survive, especially in in troubled times. So the moves they've made, I think, provide focus. It provides reliability for retailers, and it's it, they're good moves. So now let's talk about the top selling comic issues of 2019. DC's Detective Comics 1000 is the best seller, followed by Image Comics Spawn 300. Uh, DC only placed one more comic in the top 10. DC's number one. Other than that, it was all Marvel, led by X Men number one with debut issues of Black Cat, Absolute Carnage, House of X, Powers of Ten, and War of the Realms, along with Marvel's fake milestone, Marvel Comics 1000. These numbers really demonstrate the power of Jonathan Hickman's X-Men reboot and the highly anticipated event series like Absolute and War, Absolute Carnage and War of the Realms, which did underperform later on. Uh, looking at these numbers, it's kind of understandable why Marvel is so keen on playing this short game and flooding their release schedule with reboots and events. Well, yeah, absolutely. It's a system that that works for them. And and people take shots at Marvel, myself included, for for some of their oversaturation strategy and and what they've done. But the key thing to note is is it's worked for them. They're playing a game that they're comfortable with. I mean, if you use a football analogy, the Patriots play a certain type of football, and it works for them. And and sometimes they lose and they don't get to where they are. But on on the whole, on the average, this strategy works for them. You, you have DC with some strong top sellers like like Detective Comics 1000, but you know DC and Marvel, everybody knows you're not going to be able to do that month in, month out. It's an anniversary. It's a one-off issue. Same thing with Spawn. So Marvel has put their attention more into making sure that they can protect their, you know, it's, it's hard to say middle line because these are the top selling books in the industry, but they're, they're not trying for home runs. They're trying for strong singles and just perfect that system. And I've, I've now mixed football and baseball and all kinds of analogies all together. So there you have it. Well, yeah, hopefully we'll be talking about tennis soon. But not <laughs> long ago, you know, Marvel still dominated the market share, but DC ruled the top 10 comics sold list. You know, what happened to DC's domination at the top in 2019? Um, I, I think that they they part, partially, I think they made some investments for the future. I think the attempt to bring in... Uh, or well, I'll get to that in a second. But the the whole um, you're the villain and that tactic was was a way to kind of build to something and kind of use that as a bridging strategy reformat their line. Um, something that Dan Didio does uh, frequently. You saw it with Convergence. He thinks in terms of you know making a short term term move to make a longer term move better. And I think 2019 for DC in many cases was a rebuilding year in in a lot of respects. But I also think and and here's the other side to that coin. DC was counting on a very big acquisition they made talent-wise to bridge that gap and not have this fall be as big as it was. And that was Brian Michael Bendis, and it did not hit like, like thought. Um, there's nobody at DC is openly stating that you know Bendis was a was a flop. But some people are saying that, you know, in, in videos and other things. Um, but it it certainly did not provide the power to their sales that a you know, Jack Kirby or John Byrne or others, when they had that kind of big talent acquisition, they promoted it did. Uh, that's That, I think, was a negative surprise DC got. They were hoping that Bendis would carry them through this era a bit more. You know, so now let's look at the numbers for graphic novels. It's almost a complete 180, dominated by DC and Image Comics. Marvel didn't place a single book in the graphic novel top uh, 10 sales list for 2019. DC Comics had the highest selling graphic novel with Watchmen, as well as uh, Mr. Miracle, Batman White Knight, Batman the Killing Joke, and Batman Dam. Image Comics had the second best selling graphic novel with Saga Volume 1, as well as Umbrella Academy Volume 1, Apocalypse Suite, Monstrous Volume 1, uh, Die Volume 1, Fantasy Heartbreaker, and Walking Dead Volume 131. Now, I have a few takeaways from this uh, on this here. Let's talk about DC first. Batman is still king in comics, placing two comics in the top 10, three graphic novels in the top 10. How long can DC continue relying on the Dark Knight to keep sales up? I mean, there, until it runs into the ground, I, unfortunately. But but Batman has probably a, a lot of legs underneath him. I mean, there will be a movie at some point that's going to help. Um, it's, a, it's a classic character. People know it. And if you look at DC and their graphic novel strategy and a lot of the titles you listed, you'll notice that almost all of them were attached to movie properties. I mean, the Umbrella Academy did not sell how it sold because people just were interested in the comic one day. It sold because of Netflix. And mm -hmm. that's how it, these things happen. I think that, you know, DC has a better system for graphic novels. I think you, you made the mention, you know, Marvel didn't place. And the the shocking thing there is that 
you know, Marvel has, has were loudly touting their strategy with Scholastic and with graphic novels and putting these books out, and they were doing so well during with trades. So, you know, as a couple of years have gone by now, and Miss Marvel did sell well as a trade, and so did Squirrel Girl at one point. But you, you go to sites like Scholastic and you look for Marvel, and you, you do it for yourselves at home. It's it's publicly available. You'll you'll struggle to find their books. They've they've really they're not creating the classics that are going to be evergreen like a watchman like killing joke and they're just they're not generating these new titles like they should be and image has come in and and pretty much taken the vacuum of being able to sell stories that are fairly contained good trade reads and and just be able to to market that way and you hear uh eric stevenson and others talk about where image is going they're going to continue to push into this line it's it's a it's a again these are the canary in the coal mine type things for marvel um, having this graphic novel story is bad news. It's saying that the longevity of some of their stories are, are just not where they should be. You know, where is the War of the Realms? Where is the Absolute Carnage? Where where are some of these books? You know, House of X, uh, Powers of Ten, undoubtedly will be on these lists and and will do well in the future, undoubtedly. But they should be cranking out with with the amount of material because keep in mind they're using a flooding strategy. They should be having at least 20% of the graphic novel market every year. And that's, that's very, very shocking that they did. You know, I want to expand a little bit on image comics. You know, they're the other big winner in the graphic novel sales for 2019. There appears to be a high demand for their creator owned non superhero properties in this format. Should they start limiting the amount of comics they release in floppies and concentrate on graphic novel format for the audience that seems to prefer that? You know, it's it's interesting. I think the the short answer would be yes, but but another way to look at it might be is what is it costing them to release floppies? Is it a terrible business decision? Is it a money loser? Is there a reason why not to do floppies? Um, you could make a, a strong argument that the floppies are a test for how hard and how fast to go with some of these graphic novels. If the graphic novels start selling and doing really really well, then putting the floppies out, gauging interest, getting some early buzz will give them a much more informed marketing strategy for these books at, I mean, negligible prices. Producing a floppy for Image and putting it through their channel because they're already established is, is not hard to do. Now, logistically, maybe hard to do for the creative team, but it's, it's not a big deal for Image to do this because they already have the mechanism put in place. So if you're looking at it from a business standpoint, it's just smart business to put these floppies out, even if you don't expect the majority of your sales to come there because it's, it's, it's almost free market testing before you have to spend bigger dollars. So the, the final thing, you know, I want to talk about, of course, is, is Marvel. They were shut out. You know, I, I've got a couple of points here. One, the MCU delivered three films based on classic Marvel comics and generated over $5 billion worldwide in 2019. How is that not translating to sales of Infinity Gauntlet, Captain Marvel, and Spider-Man graphic novels? And two, uh, we've got into this a bit, despite dominating the market, is there a perception, you know, in the industry that Marvel is no longer creating classic comic stories? Um, well, this is a bunch of questions there. I mean, so first off, um, and this is the big thing I hook on, the fact that the MCU, and and by the way, I think Feige coming in to now have more control over Marvel and how Dis Disney is trying to avoid a Star Wars-like situation. And it is a bad sign. And a lot of people within the, within the company, certainly at higher levels at Disney, do worry that these two businesses are not more aligned. They Disney has made so much money off merchandising. It's their bread and butter. It's it's uh, licensing is a huge deal for them. And the fact that they've created a really successful movie universe, whether you like the films or not, financially, it's a very successful movie universe. And it's not translating very well to licensing and to books is a, is a huge red flag. And they're going to aggressively try and fix that. There's a million reasons why that might be. I think it's a broken channel. I think they've they've allowed people who are not necessarily the best at the business to, to run the show for too long. Lots of reasons. But I think that is going to be repaired. Uh, on the other part, despite dominating the market, yeah, I think there is a perception that Marvel, I, maybe it's not that they're not creating classic stories. It's more that they create almost junk food stories. They're, they're creating things that you get, like Absolute Carnage, I think, is a great example of this. It's a book you pick up, it's a book you read, maybe enjoy. Is it a book you're going to remember 10 years from now? Probably not. And that may be overly harsh to say it that way, but it's it's that's kind of the business Marvel has gotten themselves into. They're creating fast food type comics. 
And again, it's working for them in unit and dollar share uh, perspective. But I think longer term, that's a bad sign. I think they need to be figuring out what those big classics are. House of X, Powers of 10 is, is one of those. What are the others? And uh, maybe, and, and part of it, by the way, is, is the way Disney and Marvel pay their creators. They're paying them to be short-term thinkers. We've heard many interviews from, from creators saying, you know, we don't try and come in and create classic long-term stories because we don't know if we'll be on the book two months from now. So, you know, and it's not our characters anyway. So why bother almost approach? And this is a common sentiment within Marvel uh, from the creator side. So then when you get to the market, you know, they're not stupid. They're seeing the same things. You know, so we, we kind of ran over the, the overall numbers. We, we dove into the, to the sales of, of comic books and graphic novels. Uh, is there anything else that you gleaned out of this or you want to say before you wrap this up? Yeah, I think, you know, to, to two sides of the coin. The first, the comic industry is not imploding and dying like, like many have, have speculated and said, you know, frankly, for their own gain. Um, the comic industry is stable. The other side of that coin is stable is not good enough. If, if you are creating a multi-billion dollar movie industry and a media industry and you're looking to make streaming services and comic books are perfect material and will be for a long time to come as streaming service fodder. I mean, they're making a MODOK show. There's a lot of IP out there. And so stable is not acceptable. And I think, you know, people get confused when you say the comic industry can be doing better by saying, oh, you're, you're hating on comic creators or you think the whole thing's gonna blow up. No, the thing's not gonna blow up, but this needs to be better. It must be better. And that the big companies have to worry about that. The creators coming in have to worry about that. And if you're an independent comic creator doing a crowdfunding thing, you should be worried about that. We have to make this thing bigger using every channel we have. And too much infighting right now, it's, it's just not happening. So I wanna say thank you very much for, for joining me and help me look at some of these uh, 2019 uh, sales for the for the year, and I really appreciate your insight. Absolutely, thanks for having me on. I, I always try and bring some controversial topic to the table, so let's see what people think. All right, well, we'll do it better next time. We got more controversial stuff in the pipeline. <laughs> there you go. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews, and don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much much more, you can follow me on Twitter at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.